I wanted to kind of shift focus, though, on this question to the reports about Russia and Iran and its uh, strengthening relationship, uh, a burgeoning strategic partnership, which has had the Western media going kind of out of their minds about weapons transfers on both sides. And I wanted to ask you about, you know, uh, not only this, but you also have, uh, you know, a special envoy to Israel's foreign ministry talking about how an all-out war with Iran is inevitable with Israel and that the U.S. should strike now. The U.S. should strike now. So uh, talk about the impact of the Russia-Iran relationship as it pertains to these developments that are going on in West Asia, Gaza, and the broader regional war that is brewing or happening and about to get worse. Uh, so, so for several years now, Russia and Iran have had a strategic partnership. It must be said that Iran and China have a strategic partnership. And Russia and China have a strategic partner. You see where this goes, right? And yearly, they also do joint naval drills, the three of them uh, together uh, off the, the, the coast of Iran. Uh, so um, now, supposedly, Russia and Iran are still on track to sign a new improved strategic partnership in October, right? That's the last word we have. What the details of this new, deeper, stronger strategic partnership will be, I don't know. Is it, it's not, it's unlikely, but it's not inconceivable that they could include a mutual defense clause like the Russians just signed with uh, North Korea effectively making them actually military allies, you know, akin to NATO. That's that's not impossible. I, I, I'm not so sure Russia's willing to go that way yet, but maybe, right? Maybe they're that angry. That's, that's possible. But quite obviously, there's a huge amount of Russian-Iranian military cooperation, intelligence sharing, and, and trans military transfer going on right now. Russians and Iranians fought side by side in Syria, remember, uh, against Western forces, against jihadis, uh, you know, of, of all stripes uh, there, uh, and uh, gained a, a lot of respect for each other. Qasem Soleimani gained a lot of respect in, in Russian military circles, from, from what I've heard. Um, so uh, we have seen the Iran. Uh, transfer uh, to Russia uh, initially some Shahed drones and then the rights to uh, produce their own variants of them, you know, uh, so so the, the rights there. Now, I know there's talk, continuing talk about other types of drones and ballistic missiles from Iran that may have happened, may not, who knows at this point, I haven't seen any firm evidence. Uh, but in the past week, there's been lots of talk a uh, uh, week plus of uh, Russian transfer of military equipment to uh, Iran. Now, immediately after the assassination of uh, Ismail Haniya, the Hamas uh, political leader and chief negotiation diplomat uh, in Tehran, he was killed on the evening, uh, on the attending of the new Iranian president, uh, Masoud um, uh, Pezheskian. Uh, sorry, my brain is dying here after an hour already. Um, uh, he was attending the inauguration and he was assassinated there. And there's a lot of misinformation, but it, it, it's I mean, obviously Israel was responsible. And immediately after that, and it was declared and assumed that there would be an Iranian military response, there were reports, credible reports, that there was basically a non-stop flights of Russian Il-76 military transports over the Caspian back and forth uh, to, to Iran, uh, transferring military something. Uh, and this wasn't reported. It, Russia and Iran, the, their governments, their media don't didn't officially acknowledge any of this, but it was initially reported in the Israeli media and the uh, Kiev regime's media or propaganda 
um, and then later in, in some in the Western media that Russia was transferring to Iran. Uh, first, the Russia is one of their most powerful electronic warfare complexes, the Murmansk BN, long range, very powerful, capable of lots of different operations. Um, uh, then uh, there was also some mention of Iskander ballistic missiles. Uh, it seems that one seems unlikely to me, but uh, the Israeli media was reporting it. And now in the last week, the New York Times has reported that Russia has also been transferring S-400 air defense systems uh, to Iran. Is that true? Does Russia have S-400 air defense systems to spare at this point? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I don't know how many they have in inventory. I don't know anyone else who does know either. Uh, but it's interesting that the New York Times was reporting this. So um, is Iran yet going to launch a major military retaliation that would in include the entire axis of resistance, Hezbollah, Qatayb Hezbollah, the Houthis in Yemen? Very probably, I would say, yet. They may be taking this extended time to to uh, hook up and network Russian air defense if if Russia has provided it to them and electronic warfare, expecting a, an Israeli either counter retaliatory strike or even a preemptive strike uh, when they sense that Iran is about to go. They've been talking about that. The Americans have been talking about that. Uh, so uh, obviously Russia is providing something uh, at the minimum. Russia is providing satellite and other intelligence to Iran, right? At a minimum. Uh, and probably some level of military equipment. But Russia and Iran are now, you know, I, I think strategic partners doesn't go far enough at this point. They're, they, they, they understand they're, they're in a war with the U.S., with U.S.-led Western global hegemony together. That they fall, uh, they rise or fall. You know, the multipolar world is born or dies. You know, by them and and China also, and and possibly a few others. And they're taking a look at what each has, what assets, what what particular um, arrows each of them has in their respective military and uh, intelligence quivers. And saying, oh, oh, that's nice. I, I could use that. And then, you know, you could probably use this. And and they're, that's what the, the strategic partnership means at this point. When, when you hear military technical cooperation, it's not a joke. And it has to, I want to say it right out. Russia has supposed treaty allies in the collective security treaty organization, Kazakhstan and, uh, you know, Belarus and others. But who has provided real military support for Russia in their time of need? Iran, not Kazakhstan, not not the Central Asian states, and and Lukashenko just playing his usual games because he doesn't have any room left for maneuver. But uh, the the Russian Iranian uh, friendship alliance, I'll, I'll go that far, even if it's not a mutual defense clause declared yet it's a military alliance it's closer than ever even after the i mean the, the russian government got along good with raisi but um uh, they also appear to have um uh good relations with Pazeshkin uh, so far i don't expect anything to change uh in that regard everything uh looks like it's only accelerating in that direction and um Russia also sees it as part of the payback they promised to the U.S. You you make problems for us on, on what are geopolitical red lines for us. Well, then we're going to make problems for you and what are geopolitical red lines for you. And right. You know, here's this convenient crisis uh, going right along. And, and there was a CNN report just over a week ago that Russia was about to transfer um, uh, um, uh, anti-ship missiles to the Houthis. Uh, 
um, for use against uh, U.S. warships and and possibly other uh, you know, uh, Western Israeli aligned shipping in the Red Sea. Now, I don't know if that's true or not, but CNN certainly does. It's a possibility. Supposedly, Russia was talked down from that. But after these latest escalations, are they going to be talked down by anything in the future? I, I very much doubt it. Uh, so whereas up until two years ago, Russia very much tried to maintain a balanced business-like relationship with Israel, that's that's gone out the door in the last two years. I mean, the geopolitical bloc, Russia and China, and you know, they always say we're not interested in geopolitical blocks. You know, oh, and it doesn't matter because geopolitical blocks on the other side are interested in you, and that's forcing uh, you know everyone to take a side uh, at this point. You you know, you're either with us or you're against us. And the Americans keep saying that to everyone. Well, you know, some people are choosing to be on the other side of that calculus. Um, and um, so um, Russia and Israel are now, Russian-Israeli relations are now very bad. And you'll notice that Abbas, the Palestinian Authority leader, was just in Moscow. Uh, where uh, in uh, one of Putin's uh, summer residences outside of Moscow, apparently him and the boss had a three-hour sit-down, um, which is pretty substantial. Um, and so I, I really want to know. You know, I don't expect to see Russian troops in Palestine, but um, uh, 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 Palestine also just had a meeting with China, quite yes. obviously. Russia and China, which had previously tried to stay above the fray on the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, that's out the that's out the roof, right? I mean, they're not going to send; they don't have the power projection to send troops or jets to defend Palestine. But obviously, they are galvanizing politically the rest of the world, which is horrified by what's going on and seeing this genocidal monster Netanyahu received 56 standing ovations or 58, whatever it was from the U S Congress. Uh, and, uh, the rest of the world, I mean, it, it makes it easier for Russia to make their case in Ukraine, you know, when they, at the same time, all of this is going on to the Palestinians. That's, that's a little cold blooded to say, but, uh, it's very true. Uh, and, I personally can't think of anything that would help Russia more than if a major war kicked off between Israel and Iran right now, because that would mean more military assets. The U.S. can't even provide enough air defense interceptor missiles or artillery shells for the Kiev regime, much less supply them to both the Kiev regime and Israel. Uh, and that, while there's not, there's certainly not complete overlap of military supplies, it would be two very different conflicts. There is enough, and there is some, and particularly air defense interceptor missiles uh, are, are, are a crucial thing there. So Russia and China very much have an interest in seeing, right? China, if a, if a US, uh, in, if US gets involved in a fight against Iran uh, in uh, the Middle East, even if it's just long range strikes, that puts off for another year or two or three, any possibility of the U.S. provoking something with China uh, because that's more assets being used up. So whatever they may say publicly, Russia and China are probably at some level make a calculation. Maybe there are cons as well, but the, the, certainly the argument can be made that uh, it would be to their benefit to see the U.S. Uh, getting bogged down in another uh, conflict in the Middle East. Playing. They can't even play whack-a-mole successfully against the Houthis in Yemen, uh, much less a full-scale war with Iran and the entire axis of resistance. The U.S. has been trying to avoid it, I believe, uh, but they also can't stop supporting Israel. They just can't do it. It's politically impossible in the U.S. Yes. Um, it's uh, it's amazing the amount of of uh, political control, the power that IPAC has in the U.S. Trump was just talking about it uh, recently uh, about how powerful IPAC is. He was actually saying they're not as powerful as they used to be, but he was actually speaking in very complimentary terms because he would be an even bigger supporter 
him and Vance uh, than, than Biden is, because then it wouldn't just be U.S. Israel. It would be he also has good personal relations with Netanyahu, which, which Biden doesn't. So I still expect a large scale Iranian response. I think it won't be the pantomime that it was last time. And I think Russia in multiple ways may be helping them prepare for it right now. So yeah. hold on to yeah. your hats. It could be a major, <laughs> major, that major war in the Middle East could be breaking out yet. And again, yeah. I don't think Russia and China will get directly involved, but I believe they'll very much give almost as much support to Iran as uh, the U.S. and the West are giving to Ukraine. I mean, tit for tat, right? Proxy, you want to play proxy war? We can play proxy war, too. Yeah, I mean, it's pretty astounding, too, even just that the, all these points that you make, Mark, had me thinking, too, over the course of what's been happening in Gaza, right? You, you don't have, let's say, Netanyahu going to Moscow or Netanyahu going to Beijing and getting any kind of applauses. He doesn't even get an invite. And then you had, you were talking about this support for Iran. I mean, you had China's foreign minister, Wang Yi, literally call the new acting foreign minister in Iran and say, we defend your right. We, we uphold your right to defend yourself, which is in all intents and purposes. And your, uh, I mean, when they're talking Palestine, it has to be said that Russia and China recognize a Palestinian yes, state. They do as do. does most of the rest of the world outside of the West. Not just the people, not just the nation, but the Palestinian state, which exactly. Israel is militarily occupying and ethnic cleansing and annexing. Yeah. So we have this alignment going on, which I think many people in the collective West who are so critical of Russia, China, and Iran don't see. But now you have the Western they don't media. Want see yeah they, they see yeah. it but it's, no no they, they, they've got to fight over something sometime they can't possibly yes. cooperate against us they've been saying that since 2010 2009 2010 when i was at the lse uh, russia and china will never cooperate long term there's too many interests and and as much as wrong as, as as horrible as the man was and as wrong as he was about many other things there's a big new brzezinski May he rot in hell. Very much yeah. talked about the emerging axis of the aggrieved, mm. the the countries that the U.S. was pushing off, pissing off in their push for hegemony around the world that were growing to cooperate. Not because Russia and China and Iran have anything really in common ideologically or politically or religiously, other than a vision of a shared multipolar world not dominated by u.s led western global hegemony but turns out that's enough if you push them enough and well i wanted to ask you should... <laughs> yeah your final comment then mark on this because in foreign policy magazine there's a really yeah. interesting recent article on how the axis of evil is overhyped and they're talking about russia china iran and now the dprk because you mentioned earlier mark about uh, russia and the dprk uh being uh, uh also uh, very much aligned militarily so mark can you correct the record here i mean first we have the axis of evil rhetoric coming up again um the ghost of john bolton uh, never seems to go away but talk about the reality of the situation because what this what this so-called expert at uh, the uh, neocon rag foreign policy magazine is saying is that this is all temporary that everything is just simply bilateral. There's sure, no if U.S. hegemony goes away tomorrow, if they stop trying to force their will on the rest of the world, yeah, it would. But I don't think that's likely to happen. I don't think the U.S. is is politically capable of giving up U.S.-led Western global hegemony. The Europeans would freak out if the U.S. They sometimes seem more, at least this slate of leaders, seem more committed to it than uh than sometimes than the u.s does uh you know they were so happy to have the assumed u.s role as hegemon come back when trump was was replaced with biden they were like oh you know you you, you were a little weird there for a while you're back lead us you know lead us hegemon lead us and they were so happy to have their hegemon hegemonic master back 
but and this is just again this, this is that hopium and copium that they've been saying for the last 10 years and if if the obvious china's refusing to bow to us sanctions over russia and and the rest of it has to be said not just china the rest of the world as well india india is not included in that right the the language used uh, by china or by the us now against uh, 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 China, China, Russia trade is calling China a decisive enabler or something of the sort. Now, notice they don't mention India because it's too ge geopolitically important a pivot point for them. But actually, in terms of expansion of trade, you know, not not just the existing total of trade, but in, in terms of sheer growth. Russian and uh, Russian uh, Indian trade has jumped even more than in growth rate terms than Chinese uh, Russian trade has jumped. So, um, and then the military transfer that's going on between Russia and Iran, uh, you know, again, both sides giving to both sides. And then if you don't think that there's intelligence sharing going on between both of them and China as well, uh, and if they're not transferring to China, everything they learn about what U.S. weapons systems and uh, tactics and everything that's going on and vice versa. I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. This is hopium and copium. I would counter to this. The axis of evil is overhyped. NATO is overhyped. NATO. Y NATO unity, right? Are, how, how unified are Hungary and Slovakia behind this proxy war going on? Yeah, how how unified is NATO uh, bitching back and forth to each other about uh, the um, uh, spending and who's spending what? And Germany is like, oh, yeah, we want to increase spending. Can we count the money we're spending on roads as, as military spending and just call it even? Cool. Are we cool? You know, I mean, talk to me again uh, about unity there. The U.S. just blew up Germany's energy pipeline and uh, you know stockholm syndrome german leaders are are parroting this uh, no nato unity western unity is overhyped that that that's the way i would respond to this type